Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Quinn Jacobson, and welcome to the Studio Q Show Live. We got a great show for you today. I think you guys are going to find this fascinating, interesting, and I bet you learned something too. Um, hey, Steve Wilson, good day, good day. Hey, Will, good to see you guys. And Jeffrey's in here. We'll have some more people jumping in. There's Jan in Norway coming in. So today we have a, another guest. Hello, Chris, Christian from Germany. We have another guest. David Lewis is with us today, this morning, this afternoon, uh, from uh, Canada, Ontario province, northern. He's way up north there. I couldn't believe how far north he was. Um, he's gonna. He's been in the business a long time. He's been doing uh, bromo oil, oil, carb, uh, carbon, carbro transfers, all kinds, oil, all kinds of stuff. So uh, at the end of the day. You're going to hear about a lot of processes, many, many decades of experience of work. He'll share his background, his, we'll look at some of his work, that kind of thing. You can ask him questions. Let me do a couple of technical things here. I'm going to post this StreamYard link um, into, I guess people didn't get the StreamYard link over there. Let me do that, Pablo, yes, there it is. So if you don't have the StreamYard link, come on in. Um, there's plenty of room in here right now. Uh, people are coming on YouTube. Good. So if you don't have the StreamYard link, it's on the YouTube chat, or uh, on the chat list there. And when we're ready, or if you want, you can post your questions anytime. I'm going to introduce David. He can talk about himself. I'll just uh, sprinkle a couple of questions out. We can go through. We're going to look at some of his work. I'll, I'll take that from this side. He can kind of, kind of guide me through. And uh, we'll talk about some interesting printing out processes, pigment printing, basically, pigment printing, getting away from diverting away from the silver chlorides and the silver nitrate and all this stuff that all those uh, kind of traditional silver prints. We're going to go way off and talk about gelatin and ink and swelling and bleaching and all kinds of good stuff. So let's. Uh, Let's do this. Let's have um, private chat. Let's have. Uh, I'm going to come over here, David. I'm going to open up your website sure. and have that ready. And his website is bromoil.com, which is awesome. And I'm going to open up his site, and then I'm going to turn that time over to him here for just a minute. And I'd like, if you will, David, if you can introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your history, like we, we were just chatting, just give a little bit of history and talk about your uh, yourself experience yeah, in the uh, alternative printing out processes. All yours, David. Thanks for coming on, by the way, too. I appreciate oh, thanks. that. Thanks, Quinn. Um, I first started working in the darkroom when I think I was around 12 years old, and the first papers I printed with were India Tone and Sycora, uh, Dassonville, Defender. And then from there, uh, it was a passion of mine. I had a great deal of difficulty reading and writing, so, but with photography, I could see and I could interpret, or at least I thought I could, but I couldn't. And uh, I've been working in the processes for, I don't know, 55 years now, maybe, and uh, love every minute of it. And I became interested in brome oil in the 60s. And uh, during that time, I was also a professional photographer, and I've just slowed down. I'm no longer doing any commercial work. But during my career as a professional photographer, I was an industrial portrait photographer, and I did mostly annual reports for major corporations throughout North America and also a few in Europe. In the United States, my, I guess my, one of my uh, largest clients are, was uh, John Deere in Moline, Illinois, Quaker Oats in Chicago, and a number of other countries. And then in Canada, it was all the major banks, financial institutions, uh, beer companies, Molson's, liquor, so it was portraiture, black and white color. And at one time uh, during my career for 25 years, I would suit probably six to 800 sheets of film a year, uh, a week. And back in the early days, weddings were done with four or five graph flexes. So all the candidates were four or five. And uh, I would develop black and white film, four by five film, 48 sheets at a time. 
five by seven were portraits and eight by 10 were studio portraits also. And we used hot whites. So that gives you some indication of my training. Training, And I worked with Al Gilbert, who was a great uh, Canadian photographer. And he passed away two years ago at the age of 96. And a couple of weeks before he passed away, I was down in the studio and I was helping him edit it, uh, negatives and, uh, and cropping and prints. So that was right up to the age of 86. And I just hope uh, I can last that long too. There's a lot of work to do. And I became interested in Bromoil. I had many, many... Um, old masters that helped me along. Uh, the principal one was Georgia Proctor Gregg in England, who was the greatest bromoilist of all time. Uh, no one could ink up like she can. I can't do what she did, uh, to be quite honest with you. No one else could either. And uh, there were other influential people, Clarence Cook in the United States, Ralph Davis uh, in Europe. Uh, there was also uh, Trevor Jones in Wales who taught me how to ink up on RC paper and make transfers with it way, way back. Uh, so it was a lot of fun and uh, I just had a passion for Bromwell. It was something I could interpret, I could express myself with it, and not all images are suited to Bromwell. So uh, before I started Bromwell, I made gum prints with Neil Newton back in the 60s and then I went into carbon. I really liked that, but uh, carbon was a tricky process. Uh, difficult to get the carbon tissue uh, that wasn't fogged and uh, uh, I moved on to Bromwell and I've always was fascinated with it and uh, I remember photograms of the years when I first saw it when I was a kid and those were I have every single issue of photograms of the year plus I think I have seven copies of camera work so it was a great influence there but the greatest influence was Georgia Proctor Gregg and um, she really really um, Help me, I'll tell you. What, I think was it about, what was it about her process that was so special? Or what was it about her technique in the process that was so special? Uh, she taught me sensitivity or brought out this. She didn't teach me. She brought out the sensitivity in me. And her genius was in making 11 by 14 Bromwells that had absolutely no grain in them. They were very photographic and the detail in them was incredible. I think if you take a look on my book, there's... Um, a photograph in there of pink flamingos and you can count every single feather on those even though you probably can't see it totally in the book but I have the prints hanging on the wall in the house and uh, a remarkable person and she would spend hours and hours and hours up. after she started her ink cup she would um, probably send five or six hours tiffling and people ask me what tiffling is I think I'm going on too much about it but no. um, she would just gently gently touch the matrix with the toe of the brush hog hair brush or fitch and um, she would close the grain up and she had great patience for it she was also a ballerina in her career and she danced with Margot Fontaine so uh, that was her history um, very very sensitive an absolute genius and a wonderful lady um, yeah we loved her uh, Billy and I yeah she was just great and uh, I'm going to post a photograph of Billy and her on the website um, sometime soon in the next couple of days but Georgia died in 1990 and on the same day that she passed away I knew something was wrong with her uh, and I tried calling her I couldn't get any answer it was in very cold day and on that same day another great photographer we were friends with was Clarence Cook down in uh, Cincinnati so it's quite a coincidence but mm -hmm. uh, in any event not every process uh, uh, or every image not every image is suited to uh, Bromwell so that's why I branched out and during the 80s uh, I worked with Kodak and uh, at their um, factory and they gave me the run of it so I was making gravure separations for copper plate uh, uh, copper plate photogravures and now I've been making them with the um, polymer gravure and I still do gelabrome and uh, uh, carbro and carbon although I this is a good time of year to do it because it's cool in the basement but uh, uh, Gelabrome is a derivative, not a derivative, but very similar to Carbro. And uh, Gel uh, Georgia invented that back in the 70s. And uh, I assisted her with the chemistry of it and uh, perfection of the of uh, coating the um, uh, paper. 
And the final image is just pigment on a gelatin paper, or well, a silver gelatin it was, uh, and Kent Muir art, the old Kent Muir art. So yeah, basically, you, that's, David, David, hmm. could you tell could you the tell folks, folks or explain, explain the difference between a carbon print and a carbro print, or what you're talking about there? Can you can you explain that difference just a little bit? Yeah, uh, carbo depends on a chemical action, and the carbon depends on the action of light on a piece of sensitized paper, for instance. So. Uh, you'd have a gelatin piece of paper and then you would sensitize it uh, with with carbro you would make an enlargement onto a photographic paper a suitable suitable paper super coated papers do not work very well and then you would after you've made it then you would uh, sensitize the tissue and then sandwich the two together and then after 30 minutes or 15 minutes if you're making a transfer then you would strip off the uh, the carbon tissue in hot water and then develop it out and then uh, put it into a alum bath to uh, harden the gelatin and carbon was a more direct uh, process there's plenty written about it you look on the internet uh, definitions and that would uh, lead the way yeah and to get back to Bromwell, i think i'm wandering off topic here um no you're was, fine you're fine hey, hey could you could you could you just just for the people that don't no, and I know there's probably just very few. Could you give a brief description on how a bromoil print is made? Sure. Um, it was invented and conceived in 1907 by Welbert Piper on a suggestion from E.J. Wall. And uh, that idea came up from the original Rollins process or the oil process in the 1890s. But simply stated, a bromoil print is one in which the negative is projected onto a piece of silver or a chlorobromide paper, enlarging paper. And after you've made the print, you wash it and dry it as you would any normal silver print. And after it's dry, you soak it in water and then you put it into a bleaching solution, which is composed of copper sulfate, potassium dichromate, and potassium bromide. And after the image is bleached away, it's not removed, it's bleached away, it's not removed. The silver is not taken out of the paper. Uh, after it's bleached away, then you wash out the, um, the tachromium oxide um, stain, which is greenish in color. And after you wash that out of the paper, which generally, oh, five or 10 minutes, some people take 15, then you fix it. You have to fix it so that the silver will not redevelop it. If you didn't fix it after you bleach it, if you left it in the light, the image would come back and it'd redevelop itself. Um, mm -hmm. It, just putting it on a table and redevelop, redevelop itself. So after it's fixed and washed, then you let it dry. And then if you're using um, my paper, for instance, that I had manufactured for me, it's non-super coated. And um, what you would do is super dry it. So I hold it over a hot plate on the, um, on the emulsion side and then the back of the uh, matrix, just to heat it up to get all the moisture out of the paper. And then I put it into uh, a water bath to soak for 15 minutes. And the temperature is generally around uh, 21 degrees Celsius or 72 Fahrenheit for 15 minutes. And you'll see that when you remove it and mop it off with the chamois, you can actually see a relief. And, uh, and then I just put it onto a sheet of glass and mop it off, make sure there's no water on the front or the back. If there's water in the back of the matrix at all, it can migrate to the front. So when you start inking it up, you're going to get these white spots in the paper and say, where the heck did they come from? So you've got to ensure that there's absolutely no water on the on the gelatin side and on the back of it. And then I do a walkabout uh, on the uh, paper. And that's described in the book. Uh, Robert Damache, who did incredible oil prints, never mind gum, but Robert, I have some of his prints, by the way. Uh, Robert Damache always said there isn't enough words in the dictionary to describe how to ink up. You've actually got to see it. So I walk it about in four directions. Um, I start with the short side. So on the screen now, you can see the, some uh, redwoods, old growth redwoods in California. And I would start at the top left corner and I'd walk the brush down. I charge the brush with litho ink. And I only use about a quarter inch of the toe. I never use more than a quarter inch of the toe of any brush. 
And then I just put the top of the, I put the brush at the top just over the border of the print uh, matrix. And I just push, release, push, release. And I walk the brush down to the bottom. Then I charge it with more ink and I overlap the next one. So I go right across and then I turn the matrix and I do the vertical. And then I turn it again so it's four ways. After I do that, then I put it into a water bath and soak it um, for about 30 seconds or a minute at a whatever time it takes me to uh, mop off uh, or rework the ink on the tile. And the ink on the tile is very, very thinly spread. There's no clumps or ridges. If there is, you'd pick it up, put it on the matrix, and then you can put it in the garbage. So as I rework the ink, which generally takes me about 20 seconds, then I bring the matrix out of the water and I wipe the back off with the chamois and then mop off the front, ensure that everything is... Uh, copacetic and there's no water laying around and then I gently hop it with the same brush hog hair brush uh, and I just stipple over the whole print overlapping and I never uh, uh, leave it in one spot otherwise you're going to make it one area darker one area larger so I can actually do a blindfolded and just stipple all over the paper of course within the borders of the print and uh, after I do that if I'm not happy with it but I don't have an even coating and you can hardly see the image. There's not much ink on the image. I mean, it's not like what you see on the screen. There's very, very little ink. And then I would um, re-soak it if I wasn't happy, not everything was even, bring it out, hop it again, and generally after the second hop, then I would start applying ink. So I'd pick up the uh, ink with the toe of the brush, and then I gently stipple it, and I overlap. So I'll do four or five stipples. And I do it in circular motions and I might go probably about from the edge of that left print to the first tree at the top left. That would be my first stippling and then I would carry on, recharge the brush, stipple, continue right across and I go right across and back and forth. Uh, and that generally takes me, well that print there I think is five by eight inches, it's not very large. Uh, and it would probably take me about 10 minutes work. If you have more humidity in the room, the better because the matrix stays moist in hot, dry weather. When I was working in New Mexico back in the 90s, man, I had to re-soak it every three minutes because the air was only 10% moisture. So if you live in a dry climate, you got to re-soak or you can put a humidifier in and uh, bring up the temperature or not the temperature, but the humidity of the room. So. That's basically it, and I work it right across, and after each application of ink across the matrix, I would put it into the water, apply more ink, and after each full go-around, I call it, it's not very good English, then I would put it back in the water, bring it out, and then I would hop it. And hopping it is very gentle. You're not hammering or pounding it. You're doing it very, very gently. And I would do this with a hog hair brush, and well, maybe after 40 minutes on this particular one, it's just about finished. And just to clear the highlights and bring out a little more contrast, I would soak it. And if I wanted to maintain that etching-like quality, I would use a second hog hair brush and just gently hop it, and that would clear it. If I wanted a more photographic rendition, I would use a Fitch hair brush. And the Fitch hair brush I've been using for the last 50 years uh, and it was well used when I got it from uh, a famous photographer in England named Fred Judge. So this brush has been used, this feature has been used since 1928. And I'm still using it today. <laughs> and the other thing too is if you want a more etching-like quality, then you use a harder ink, litho ink. If you want a more photographic rendition, then start with a hard ink and then gradually soften it. And as you soften the ink, you've got to raise the temperature of the matrix five degrees um in some cases if it's not going into the highlights and the more you work a print the more it's going to close up the grain and eliminate the um the contrast so uh, eliminate the uh, etching light quality yeah. and that's what i love about it so much is the etching light quality that bromoil gives me and it gives me control that you don't have in black and white printing and of course photoshop's changed everything but back in the day, I look at the work I did back in the 70s and the 60s and the 80s. I says, how the hell did I ever do that? Um, but I managed to burn. I might make 20, 25 prints before I get one that I say, oh, yeah, I can bleach this and ink it up. Whereas now with Photoshop, I, if you want to hear about how I do it, simply what I do is I, if I'm working with a digital file, um, 
I work in uh, CS6, if I have negatives and I've got, I don't know, 40, 50,000 negatives, then I would scan the negative into Photoshop. And then after scanning the negative, um, I would work on it, burn it. And I don't change much. If there's something in there like telephone wires, I leave them there. I, I'm a purist in that way. And uh, after I've made the, the changes in Photoshop um, and I'm happy with the contrast and the printing depth, the print's a little deeper than normal uh, for my um, situation because the water is very soft here. If you go into West Virginia, um, Quinn, I think there's prints in West Virginia there. If you take a look at those, uh, you can see some are very photographic and some are very etching like. Uh, that's a very etching like hard ink. That's 11 by 14, that image. But um, just lost my train of thought. Oh, after I made the negative uh, or the print in Photoshop, I, I printed out. I, had, I used to use Epson, but man, those nozzles kept getting uh, clogged up. So, um, a long story short, Canon found out about me through my close friend in Hawaii, and they gave me cameras and uh, a printer, the uh, 1000 printer, I think it is. So I got rid of my Epson, and I've never had any problems with with nozzles cl clogging uh, with the uh, Canon printer. And uh, I print out on a high gloss paper. I do not use a, uh, what's it called, a OHT, OHP? I use that in platinum and gravure. Anyway. I use a high gloss paper and I know they have Pictorico, but that damn stuff's expensive. It's two dollars and something a sheet the last time I checked. But I was shopping in Costco and I discovered Costco paper, 125 sheets for eleven dollars. And I asked the kid at Costco if there's any writing on the back. He said no. And I says, I'll buy a box and try it. So anyway, I came home, tried it, and I printed on the Pictorico and printed on the Costco. And there was absolutely no difference in the quality of the print after I had contact printed them. In contact printing, I first determined minimum exposure for maximum black. So every single negative I print is 20 seconds. And uh, so it doesn't matter. I can print five negatives and each one is 20 seconds. And if the print isn't perfect in the fixing bath, I go back into Photoshop and I make my adjustments in the contrast and uh, that's it. So it's very productive. There's no waste. There's no test strips. And that's what I love about it. And you've got to use a soft developer. Don't use MQ developers like Dectol. That will harden the gelatin as it exhausts itself. So stay away from MQ and just stick with uh, uh, with your metal based developers or Amidol. And uh, that's what I've been doing for since 1960 something. So uh, It'll give you an idea. Those are um, very great points. I wanted to have uh, just a quick, let me do this. We're going to talk about these later, but uh, the, I went ahead and got um, David's brush set here because I'm going to do uh, this these hog hair. This hog hair. This is a beautiful set. The the two big ones here, and then the the uh, smaller ones. These are just really. I cannot wait to employ those. I. I do not do broil, but bromoil, broil. I do not do bromoil, but I do uh, oil. Mm -hmm. And these are, this is weird. David and I were talking about this. He just gave some really good examples. Some of those things you're going to hear cross pollinate. Did you hear when he talked about taking the silver gelatin print and bleaching it? What does that sound like? Sounds like to me like taking a wet collodion negative and intensifying it. You bleach that silver. Just like the old manual says, bleach it white all the way through the back. That's what David's talking about, bleaching a silver gelatin print. And here's the operative word, gelatin, right? He talks about a matrix. If you don't know what a matrix is, a matrix is the swollen gelatin. It has the relief of the image. That's what a matrix is. And he talks about the tone of the brush and how little he uses of it. Um, all those are really important things to know about hopping and inking up and and all of those, understanding the gelatin and all of that. And it just cross-pollinates. Brome oil, oil, all of it cross-pollinates. And pigment prints, period. But really good points you just brought up there, David. And yeah. we'll talk about your brushes later. But um, um, yeah, I was interested in, and let me go over here. I was interested in this, to be honest with you. I'm a, 
I'm a contest and intention guy. And I love what you said about your interest in deindustrialization. This idea of, you know, people in this room know or in the show know that we talk a lot or I talk a lot about context and intention and having a reason to make the work you make and why you're choosing the process you choose. Could you, if you feel comfortable, could you elaborate a little bit on whatever portion of this statement you want to do, but elaborate on why you selected the printing out processes that you have, the pigment prints that you have, and in, in conjunction with your work, what is it that you're trying to accomplish there? I think it's all about interpretation. And to me, personally speaking, um, bromoil satisfies my passion. I've never made a great bromoil. I've tried and tried and tried. I've made some decent ones, but once in a while I can make a very good bromoil. And it's interpretation. It's creating uh, bromoil and oil. In fact, just very briefly, if you saw an oil print in a bromoil, you'd have to look at it very closely to tell the difference. So they're one and the same, except one's through a large rent, the other's through light that hardens the gelatin. But uh, in bromoil, um, uh, it satisfies me. I can create depth, atmosphere, a recession of planes, and uh, it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to accomplish that with a silver print, I think, for my work anyway. And I have a 20 by 24 bromoil hanging in my den here where I'm working, uh, where I'm talking to you. And uh, it almost feels, well, people come in and look at it and they say, we can almost walk into this photograph. So I guess that's the reason. And I just think the subject matter that I choose, whether it's portraiture or deindustrialization, where there's been many books that I've done, I've uh, been hired to do the photography for uh, in the Rust Belt in Detroit and Ontario and down into West Virginia, the mining, uh, coal mining in West Virginia that I've been working at for the last 30 some odd years. But um, it's just interpretation. That's the whole thing. And each image is different. So uh, I think that's it. And I also addition my prints too. So, uh, so what, what, tell us, talk a little bit about that, if you will. When you, uh, uh, art, uh, photographers, artists are interested in this. How do you, what's your methodology or what's your approach to editioning? How many, why do you do it, et cetera, et cetera. T talk a little bit about that, if you would. Okay, I edition prints and I determine what the edition is going to be before I start inking up. And if it's a pain in the ass, I make an addition of one or two. <laughs> if it's not a pain in the dash, I'll go up to seven. But for the last 15, 20 years, I think, well, no, it'd be less than that. I think it's around three to five. I'll do an artist proof and then I'll do an addition of three. Now, when I'm doing platinum printing, it's an addition of five maximum. But uh, yeah, it's all addition. And when I addition something, it's only in the one process. And I know people like to addition prints. Um, if you take a look at the portrait of the uh, South Dakota, um, Lakota uh, Indian um, native person that in South Dakota, he's there's some, there he is on the left. Um, uh, that's an addition of one. And that's a Jellabrome print, which is similar to um, Carbro. And the reason I did it in Jellabrome is in Bromwell, I could still do it, but I think the tones would merge around the mouth because his nose is hanging over his lower lip of his mouth. Very sad. I spent some time with him on a reservation in South Dakota. And if you take a look at a, go back to the other portraits. Mm -hmm. um, there, if you can just click on there. That was done on Polaroid film 105. I used to do a lot of work for Polaroid back in the 70s. And that's a carbon print. And wow, 1976. Wow, that's a yeah. beautiful print. Yeah, and that was printed on um, Kentmere matte paper, I believe. Mm -hmm. And one of the best papers of the market on the market back then for Carbro and for uh, Bromwell was Kodak portrait proof paper. That was a great paper. And I've also inked up papers the last Bromwell paper 
made by Kodak. It was 1948. It was called Kodak Royal Ivory Paper. And uh -huh. I, I made prints of that when I was in Wales uh, with Trevor Jones and made transfers from that paper. That, and that would be 1976, I think. So the paper was 30 years out of date, but I still did it. Kent Muir also made a matte paper that was very good that was uh, was discontinued in 78. And I still have that paper and I can make bromoils out of that or oil. It didn't make any difference. Wow. But if you go back to the other portraits, there's one of a uh, iron worker coal miners. Let's see here. Let me get back there. There uh, he is. The one down below is a bromoil. There he is. That's a coal miner and that's uh, a bromoil print. That's nice, yeah. I, I'm trying to get them bigger, but I don't know that I can. I don't think it'll go larger. They're, they're a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, they, you can do beautiful portraits. Uh, I've got some matrices uh, to ink up now of other miners. And if you want to know how crazy or stupid I am, I've got something like 700 matrices made to ink up. <laughs> And some of them date back to 1975, 74, but I can still link them up. That's so cool. It just requires a little technique. And uh, remember when you're working with bromoil, anybody's interested, you could go into the dark room, print off a dozen prints, and then bleach them out the next day, hang them up to dry, and you've got three months of work. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're one shot. I mean, you can, you can be very, very productive. So, so those those of you that are working in bromo oil or oil, Rollins oil, or, or any of these, this stuff, as you can tell, if you're working it, you can hear him talk when he talks about these things. It dovetails beautifully into these other processes. These aren't you're just starting out here with a silver gelatin print. Gelatin yep. being the operative word here. And so when we make a wet collodion negative, and we flow. Um, you know, gelatin on a piece of paper, a piece of glass, whatever we're putting the image on, dichromate it up, ex put the negative on, expose it, wash it out, hang it up. Like you said, you're good to go. You do that, and you, you got, you can come back to them in 20 years and swell them up and ink them up. <laughs> they don't always work, but most of the time they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depending on the stability of the gelatin, huh? So, yeah, well, it hardens with age. Gelatin hard. The matrix will harden with age. And to overcome that, what I do is I, instead of soaking it at 72, I'll soak it at 75. And then I'll hang it up to dry. And the next day I'll come down and soak it again at 75, hang it up to dry. And then I come back the next day and soak it and then ink it up. So what that, does that do? Well, it just conditions the gelatin to want to swell. Okay. Okay. Talk of it going into the water and all of a sudden the gelatin will will behave itself most of the time. Sometimes it won't. I throw them in the garbage. Yeah. No, so, uh, so not to get off on the, in the weeds here, but what if a guy were to put a, a gram of alum, chrome alum, or um, use a higher bloom than 250 or something like that in the gelatin? Well, if you use chrome alum, you're going to be in trouble with, uh, with it, I think. You know, Over it's gonna, time. Yeah. 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 So that, that, what we're talking about, we're talking about having a stiff enough, a photo bloom 250. The 250 rating is the hardness of the bloom. We're talking mm -hmm. about hitting a brush or a toga brush on a matrix like that with ink. That's that's what we're talking about. So yeah. so depending on the hardness of the gelatin, and then you surely don't want it too soft. Tell me this. What happens when you take gelatin over 50 Celsius or 55 Celsius? What happens to the gelatin? If you take, uh, I will comment on that. What I will comment on is my paper. If you go up over 80 degrees with my paper, you'll blow out the gelatin. And what it means by blowing out the gelatin is the ink will not adhere to the highlights. Yeah. They are so swollen, they'll be rejected by the highlights. Remember, the antipathy of inking is that the gelatin is hardened in proportion, in inverse proportion to the amount of silver that was originally in the gelatin. So in the shadows, the gelatin is very, very hard. Ah, ah. In the highlights, it's very, very soft. In between the highlights and the shadows, you have a continuous tone, tonal range that will accept the uh, ink proportionately. 
But if you raise it too high, yes, you can get the ink in the shadows, but that ink will not want to stay in the highlights. And if you soften the ink to such a degree that it will go in the highlights, as soon as you re-soak it in the water and bring it out, the ink will roll off the paper. So you, there is a limitation. Now, on, on when I was inking up 1620s on super-coated paper, oh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, some of it was Tura paper, which was made in Germany. Um, and Kentmere, some of the Kentmere papers, um, not Kentmere, yeah, Kentmere made the paper. Um, she's a charcoal. And that required 100 degree Celsius or Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. Ooh. Because you, if you didn't soak it that high, you couldn't get the gelatin to swell. You had to get through that super coating. Ah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. In in the Rollins oil world, uh, similar. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're we're not talking about the brome oil here. It's very similar. But in the oil world, the Rollins oil world, when we take like the Photo Bloom two hundred and fifty is what I use. You could use mm -hmm. Knox gelatin or whatever. But the Photo Bloom two hundred and fifty is what I use. I do. Um, usually eight uh, percent, six to eight percent on the oil oil prints, uh, and 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 when I, if I take that, if I'm if I'm swelling that gelatin or heating that gelatin up, and if I take it over 50, 55 degrees, 140, 150 degrees Fahrenheit, that gelatin loses its ability to gelatinize. Yeah. So now you just got a big runny mess. Nothing ever sets up. Nothing ever works well. Um, another thing that I've seen are people that swell their prints too long. Is there such a thing as swelling your print too long? Yeah. What yeah. happens when you say you have a 20 degree bath or 68 degree Fahrenheit bath and you swell, you, you throw a print in there um, and you want to swell it. You want to get that matrix up and you leave it in there for four hours. What's going to happen? When you start inking it up, what, it's possible. Now, I've had an occasion where I didn't have any trouble at all, but it, what's possible is is that the brush will damage the gelatin. Yeah. All right, and that happened to me. Um, I started inking up one morning at seven o'clock and uh, my wife was going into work and she had a flat tire and I'd got just the first walkabout. And uh, so I took my vehicle in and gave her my uh, SUV and then I took care of her car and got the tire fixed so it was about three and a half hours soaking yeah came back and inked up an exhibition print so mm. that might have been an accident mm. but a good accident seems like accident <laughs> producing great prints sometimes serendipity can come in like sally man says she prays for the angels of serendipity every time she pours a plate yeah so tell us what um talk a little bit about if you will Talk a little bit about your favorite pigment printing and why, or some of the reasons, or some of your favorite, and why that those are your favorite. Oh, I think I've already mentioned that, brome oil and transfer. Okay, talk about transfer. Tell us about transfer. Well, simply what you do is after you uh, uh, bleach out the print, of course you uh, don't have to flip it. You have to flip uh, the negative uh, that you're making for brome oil, but after you make the matrix, you ink it up. And I just put a little bit more contrast into the uh, into the print so that when I ink it up, the print might be just a little touch too contrasty. And the reason for that is that when you transfer it, all the ink from the highlights and mood tones are going to transfer. And you will see in the highlights, you'll say, okay, those highlights are fairly clear. But when you make a transfer, you'll see there's more ink in the highlights than what you thought there was. So I always uh, make the negative a little bit more contrasty than normal so that um, uh, there's enough ink in the highlights that'll transfer and produce beautiful detail. And I over ink the deepest shadows just a touch. And Trevor Jones, uh, who I loved, he was a great guy. Um, he uh, always said, if the ink goes on easy, it'll come off easy. So I use a very, very gentle brush action. I work quickly. Um, and uh, if the ink goes on easy, it'll come off easy. So one pull through the etching press will transfer the ink from the matrix to a 
a final support paper. And I used to love the Lana Gravure paper, but they don't make it anymore. I was going to ask you what you transfer to now. Um, I transfer to, uh, boy, there's a lot of papers I use. Lana, Lana is another, uh, not the Gravure, but another one. Can't remember the name of it. And uh, Hannah Mueller paper, uh, BFK Reeves, Arches. Yeah, um, sure. Just about anything you want, as long as there's not, it, as long as it's not overly textured. Yeah. Um, and if it is got a bit of texture to it, you could soak the transfer paper first and get it to swell, then put it between two blotters and make your transfer. And you have to ink up with more contrast when you're making a transfer onto uh, onto uh, a damp paper. Sure. And the, and from one matrix, the most I've ever made is 14 transfers. Wow. From the one matrix, inking it up. Wow. And it took, an hour, it took me an hour and a half to do it, which is I, amazing. I I've never, never heard that. that. I've never heard of anybody doing 14 transfers off of one matrix. Yeah, I think Paul Allen Anderson did 25 once, if I remember right. Wow. But, uh, anyway. Okay, guys, what he's talking about here, he's talking about having, he's inked up a brome oil print. You, you heard it talking about easy on, easy off. He's talking about putting that on another piece of paper and pushing it through a press and pulling those apart. That's what he's talking about there, just so you know that. Uh, yeah. Really, really amazing stuff. Kind of like gravier work, right? Poly or, or photo gravier, copper plates or poly. If yeah, you don't like know about these kinds of, uh, what would you call them? Advantages, right? Advantages. Now, he just said he hit 14 prints from one matrix. That means he inked up that same print 14 times and ran it through. I mean, that that's, and then the other guy doing 25. Usually even copper plates and, and, and photogravure break down after a while. So you can imagine a gelatin matrix. Interesting stuff. I love it. Yeah. Justin, well, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, sometimes I can only make one pull and the gelatin's damaged and I just can't can't get the transfer right. So I'll make a few uh, a few matrices, matrices, and then I can, if the first matrix doesn't work out the second time, then I'll just ink up a new one and uh, transfer it. And that's how I do the addition. Another thing too, is after you've inked up, let's say for instance, it takes me 20 minutes to do an ink up for transfer. I do the 20 minute ink up, transfer it, re-soak it in the water for five minutes at 70 degrees or 72 and then I'll ink it up again and I don't do the walkabout because it already has a very very thin film on that matrix and it'll probably take me between six and seven minutes to ink it up again just stippling ink on it mm, mm. and you can also uh, after you've made the uh, uh, after you've inked up you can also cut uh, the paper so there's a quarter inch clean white border around it so that when you make the transfer you'll see the embossing uh, of the paper from the uh, matrix onto your final support paper which is pretty neat it's like a calotype or a photogravure for that instance I was gonna say Edward Curtis yeah big heavy press and you actually see the the whole thing it's it's kind of what, what do we call it uh, proof of process kind of thing mm, i guess so <laughs> the, those kind of little marks and those indicators and those those kinds of things we look for um yeah i did, I yeah, did that ahead. i did that with the copper plate photograph years there's a border around every one of them and i saw i've also done it with the polymer gravure so uh, gives you an idea now if you go to the platinum prints yes um i i just want to have everyone take a look at the platinum prints you got it uh, we'll jump over here. Portrait. It's a lot room. easier to make than Roma. It's like printing silver to me. Go to gallery. Platinum prints right yeah. here. There we are. And you can take a look. Uh, you take a look at the platinum prints and you'll see that I felt in this case that a platinum print or a carbon print uh, was more suited to uh, the image or the interpretation of it was more suited to platinum than to uh, bromoil. So that's why I went to uh, 
um, platinum on these. Now that would make a good Bromel horses, but they, I did a series um, for the last 30 years on coal mining in West Virginia, and there's a permanent exhibition down there at one of the galleries. And this is a perfect example where platinum uh, it was far superior than what a Bromel would be for interpretation. Yes, I could make a good Bromel, but I thought the impact, you know, it's got to have impact. It's got to make a statement the same here. That's a schoolhouse. I didn't realize it until about 15 years ago, but for the last 50 years, I've been photographing one room schoolhouses or abandoned schoolhouses across America. And I must have about 75 or a hundred of them now. And, uh, I'm gradually getting a few printed, but there's a perfect example where the platinum works beautifully. And it was just an accident waiting for to happen to be able to get that sky the way it was. There's no manipulation in that image at all, other than deepening the sky in Photoshop. And that was shot with a Canon 20D infrared camera, our infrared uh, conversion. And I used to love shooting with Kodak. And of course, when they just continued the, uh, high-speed infrared film, um, I went to this. There's a company, um, camera store out in Portland, Oregon, where I was uh, worked every year for 18 years. And um, uh, going out west every year, I just happened to run into situations where the skies were beautiful. Everything worked. And uh, I think that's a perfect example where... Um, where platinum or carbon carbro would have worked beautifully. And that's an addition of five, one artist proof. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, that looks great. Good good explanation on your choices there for yeah. why you, you, you choose or, or choose, what, what processes you choose on mm -hmm. interpretation. Yeah, you could drill into that and say, what do you mean interpretation? But I, but I understand you're trying to um, bring emotion and those kinds of things, the, the idea of the image drama, drama and those kinds of things and that, that interpretation, but you're right. That's a, that's a beautiful, uh, beautiful print there. So what, uh, tell us about your experience with oil printing and we'll say Rollins for this case. What's mm -hmm. your, what's your experience? What, what are some, what are, what's some wisdom you could impart to want to be oil printers out there? Boy, the same as bromoil you just you have a negative Pop of course and jump you know, and soak and go and yeah exactly yeah you don't have a, a high gloss paper you have to use the overhead transparency so i guess one has to be careful with dust yeah you know and that sort of thing and uh i use a mercury vapor uh lamp for um for oil and for other processes and for platinum i use or for carbon, I use uh, BL tubes because there's no heat. Yeah. There's heat from mercury vapor and you're in trouble. Yeah. But um, BL tubes will work perfectly and simply just sensitize either 3 or 5%. If you can get a hold of Robert Damache's book on oil printing, uh, he tells you what he does uh, with it. And uh, you could follow his instructions. But I've got so much oil paper. And if I make my own, um, you know, I just do the gelatin, coat it, sensitize it, and then soak it and ink it up. Just determine your soaking time. You've got to, you got to do some experimentation, you know, and be patient with it. Yeah. And I might add, uh, the greatest oil worker that ever lived was um, from Belgium, Leonard Misson. 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 Absolutely incredible work. Uh, he could see light. A lot of people can't see light. And I think interpreting light is in, is something else too. That's a gift. Yes. I was lucky. I was able to discover that. I, I was lecturing years ago with Karsh, and he bugged me for twenty five years to work for him, printing for him. He did Bromwell in nineteen twenty seven, by the way. And um, he was a great guy, um, wonderful man, but a little abusive to his staff. I understand, but anyway, I told him I was too. Friend was um, Andre Cortez. And I'm sure you're aware of him. And uh, I helped curate a show of his years ago. And, you know, Andre said to me, he says, David, what processes are you working on? I says, well, bromoil and oil, you know, the pigment processes. And he said to me, oh, that goddamn process. What are you wasting your time doing that for? <laughs> so every time I picked him up from the hotel to take him to the gallery, he'd ask me what I was doing. His mind was starting to you know, be a little forgetful at the time, yeah. but he was 
wonderful guy. Uh, there's some other great photographers I've met too uh, and been friends with, but uh, yeah, that's. Well, I know you. I know you haven't met Henry Peach Robinson. No, but, no, but, he, he was a little before my time. Yeah, but but what do, what do you think about his? Uh, how do we say his position in the pictorialist movement? Maybe is that a good way to put it? Well, he there was a lot of criticism about his sure sure but sure I love his work yeah sure I had an yeah open mind about it. David, I, David, my philosophy is: is anybody that makes work that gets any kind of attention will always have critics. I mean, oh, for sure, they, they're just born there. They're waiting to come out to criticize. Yeah. Um, I had a fella, I had a fella tell me from Ohio that I should work for Walmart and give up Rome while my work was so bad. <laughs> well, I says, well, how much are you getting paid an hour? So anyway, I, I says, well, I, I, I keep love paying. It. I love I it. I keep trying, so once in a while I get a good print. Look, what I love about having you on a show like this to an audience like this, because everyone out here is, is interested in some degree with uh, historic processes to some degree, um, yeah. printing out processes, whatever, is that your life, your life, the actual physical life, screams passion and is indicative of you have found something that you are completely preoccupied with, well, that's completely enough. enamored that's enough. with, and you've stuck it out. Oh, forget it. That's yeah. enough. Yeah. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Uh, you know, another great photographer was, um, and, and I think I should take some questions soon, was Arthur Kalis. Yes. And I don't know if you know yeah. him, but he's California. He did oil and brome oil, and he taught William Mortensen. Ah. Now, Bill Mortensen was a big... Uh, big name in photography, and I started uh, in the pigment processes just after he died, but I knew his wife, Meredith, who he used as a model for many years, and she sent me a whole whack of stuff of, um, of uh, Bill's work. And man, the F64 group just hated pictorialists, and uh, yes. um, Steichen was probably the leader of the group on his criticism yep. and a great book to read about uh, pictorialism is called after the photo succession and that ah. was by ronnie peterson i think the name was okay. last name is peterson get that book and read it and you'll learn why pictorialism pictorialism uh started to fall by the wayside but it was it was the f64 group yeah exactly so, yeah the movement I've got so many stories i could tell you but not enough time but <laughs> yeah. I, I think i talked enough yeah, uh, Bill, Bill Mortensen, by the Bill Mortensen, by the way, was born in Park City, Utah. If you didn't know that, he died yeah. in Laguna. But yeah, hey, yeah. let's do that. Let's let's take this last little while and open it up to questions. Jeffrey already put one up here. Um, is yeah, um, I'm going to post them up, but I'll read the ones on the. You can see Jeffrey in the the comments. He said, "Question for David: Do you know or plan ahead as to what image will be as as a final image?" As in, which process will work as what, or just trial and error? When I look through the viewfinder of a camera, I know what process it's going to be. Ninety-nine percent. I, I I just can't remember where I made a mistake like that. It's just a sense. I don't think it just happens. And I think one of the things that really, uh, really uh, frustrate me over the years was. Uh, in teaching photography and seeing other professionals and amateur is that the technique, you know, producing a black and white negative was atrocious and they never did perfect the technique of making a good negative. And anyone that comes to my house, they can look at my negatives and uh, Kodak just went crazy when they saw what I was doing. And that's why they hired me to lecture across the country because they said, this guy knows how to make a negative. And it's just something I felt intuitive. It was intuitive. It's not because I'm brilliant. It's probably because I'm dumb and I kept making mistakes. And every time I made a mistake, I tried not to do it twice. But that was <laughs> welcome to the crazy. crowd, huh? Yeah. Now, I'm talking about making 11, 14, and 8 by 10 and 5, 7 eggs. So, anyway, questions. Yeah. Um, I've got the answers. Just ask me. Okay. Here <laughs> we go. Here's Samuel. You, you, you've talked to Sam Samuel before. Mm -hmm. He's in Germany. Yes, yes, I know the name. Yeah, this is Samuel. He says, how much can you manipulate a print, for example, remove artifacts with cutting out gelatin? I don't understand the question. Um, 
I can it, manipulate. What, what he's talking about, if you have a defect on a, on a print, I don't care, it's swollen, right? Or yeah. whatever. Oh, I see. He wants to go in with an eraser, a razor blade, or how much can you manipulate it uh, with, with cutting out gelatin is what he's saying. You, you want to, uh, the gelatin is holding the imperfection. Can you cut a lot of that stuff away or no? Throw it in the garbage. Throw it in the garbage. You're, yeah. you're a man after my own heart. All this negative Why researching and all this other crap people do, I, I, I want to get it right from the get-go, right? And, and what I find in Photoshop today is people over manipulate and it's so obvious and it makes me ill. I want to throw up when I look at some of the work. I think you'll have most of the people in this group would I, I tend to agree mm -hmm. with you, David. Seems and, oh, Halifax. I love Halifax. Do you Where know you This is Mr. Dale Wilson, David. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lewis, and thanks for joining the Q show today. Absolutely. We do appreciate that your time, David. Um, I would be interested to learn if you continue to work in photogravure process, and if so, where? Kodak went out of business, and that's a place where I would work because they had great labs. And it is so dangerous working with copper plate photogravure using the acids because you have to lower the specific gravity of acid to etch the plate. You're far better to use a very safe one in polymer uh, gravure, and I really find that quite simple and it's very safe uh, to get the negative on a piece of steel plate you use water to develop it out with a brush so I think that would be the way to go and I know there are still are people doing photogravure but they've got to have a, a great facility yeah, uh, what, and, uh, yeah go quality ahead. wise what's the difference between poly and copper you can't tell the difference that's that's quite a statement yeah at least that's uh, quite a statement I've uh, I've made both uh, from 1988 was it? I don't know. There's three or four hundred of them, and then I made it uh, one last year, the year before, and you can't tell the difference between them. That's amazing. And then yeah. Dale followed up with that, but I think you've already answered that. We're talking about the acid. Here's here's ultra tras. This is the the ultra tras. This is good in musical improvis improvisation. If you make a mistake, make it twice, and everyone will think it was made on purpose. That's a great one. Thank you for putting that. Yeah, yeah that's great. It's not a question, but it's a good comment. Um, I'm a mistake made it waiting to happen, I think. There you go. And Samuel said, good answer. I like that. Thanks for chiming in, Samuel. That's yeah. a good question. And Chris says, is it possible to put on a different color, colored pigments, maybe to your kind of light and color? That's a great question. What do you think, David? Yes, you can. I don't do it, but yes, you can. Absolutely. And why don't you do that, if I might ask? Because I'm a purist. Okay. I think it compromises what I'm trying to do. And it can get really cheesy really quickly, right? I mean, it can look yeah, really, I really I taught one nasty. Fella, yeah, I, I taught one fellow years ago. He's the most obnoxious person I've ever met in my life. But he <laughs> used color pencils and crayons and tea. Uh, I, just, <laughs> I just... I'm on board with you, brother. I'm on board with you. Uh, but yes, you can. you can also do three color uh, uh, brome oil if you want to make the separations, which are pretty easy to do today compared to 25 years ago. Yeah, just like no chromates and everything else, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Fred Judge did three color brome oil at one time, and his night photography was incredible. I've you know, seen some really beautiful color carbon prints uh, recently, too. And it's yeah. probably because of the separation and digital negatives and all that kind of, and the curves and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I don't like the word purist, but uh, just, that's just my own personal thing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, pretty strict when it comes to that stuff too, for my own work. Like I want certain things made a certain way with certain materials or certain light and that kind of thing. And I just, I won't stray from that. So if I can't get it, I'll keep working at it until I can and satisfies me. I don't like the overdone, overprocessed. I know photographers that run out of work to make, or they never had work to make. They mm -hmm. love to tinker in the technical. That's what keeps them going. We we have this acronym. We say G A S or GAS, Gear mm -hmm. Acquisition Syndrome. Right? They get in. What kind of lens is that? How many milliliters did you put in that? And what did you do over here? And nothing about the content of the image. Nothing about the context of the image. So a lot of folks like to drill down into the details of the technical, and I understand that. But when we get off into retouching negatives and 
doing this and doing that, I'm totally on board. I uh, I don't like it at all. Um, well, I guess I'm a traditionalist then. There you go. I like that word, David. I like that yeah, word. Traditionalist, but yeah, it's just not for me. I, I hear you, man. I'm I'm completely on board not, with you. I'm not um, comfortable with it. What else do we have here, guys? Let's get some more questions up here. David's been at this game longer than anybody. Most of than most of you have been alive, actually. So he's got he's a wealth of information. I just I just enjoy talking to him. And again, oh, here's a good here. Let me do this, David. I've got a question for you. Sure. Uh, there's you some more coming in now too. But let me ask my question real quick. Um, yeah. Tell us about tell us about these. And I know you. I, he didn't ask me to pitch anything. He did. This is not David. This is me doing this. I fell in love. I've looked at these brushes for years now, and I fell in love with this. Will you talk about your brushes, uh, this set in particular that I got, and talk yeah, about what it is and what it's for? Yeah, I just designed those hog hair and fitch hair brushes. The large ones are number 20s, and uh, I find they work really really well with a, a larger image and even small images i mean i can ink up a two by three with the small ones uh with the large hog hair brush there and uh i've got some more being made and they're going to be number 16s a little smaller so the two you're holding up the two large ones i'm going to make them a little smaller i think people might find uh, them a little more useful uh to their style they're not as heavy they're a layer okay. lighter and uh, the other brushes I use for retouching, I don't use them often, but I shouldn't say retouching. I, if you, for instance, if you took a, if you um, had an image of that uh, coal miner, just to highlight the eyes, I would use one of those brushes just to hop it um, to clear the eyes, and uh, it works very well. I wouldn't overuse them because you've got to be careful when you're using the smaller brushes on a large print that if you work too much on one area, it's gonna close up the grain. And after you're finished, dry it and mat it, and you look at it, it says, geez, that's real fine grain in that little one area. So you gotta be careful now, if you're using a fish hair brush to finish off and work it and work it and close up the grain, then that's not a problem. But it's for highlighting things up in the sky and clouds or uh, a portrait, uh, it works very, very well. Or just getting into very small areas of, a, of an industrial um, um, site a coal mine or a paper plant or whatever uh, is sure. very, very interesting. Here's our friend Craig. Um, I think he's in New York, if I remember right. What would be yeah. the basics to start doing this technique? How often do you do classes? I don't do them anymore. No? Too old. Too old. I, I don't want to travel anymore. I, they want me to go to Australia, and I said no. And Iceland. Great. They want me back in Iceland. I, I just can't do it. I no, would, I hear you. I, I've got three people. Um, three or four people that want to take classes at my house and I'll do that. But uh, with this COVID-19, nothing's happening right now. And I'll probably only teach one or two a year. Um, certainly not in the wintertime. I don't think he'd want to be here in the wintertime. But, you know, I'm sorry. Craig's from you. I'm sorry, Craig. Yes. Well, if you do, get get back on here and uh, let us know. I'm sure there's people that would love to do, um, to be able to, to get that um experience with you and if i was to travel they did have to have fly fishing nearby otherwise i won't come oh man uh, craig craig's got that he's in utah that's he's got fly fishing all over you you can you can email me about uh taking a class and i'll respond to you offline or off the web here yeah david's really good about communicating he's just johnny on the spot with the emails and that so he's he's awesome yes i uh I understand about, um, I often wonder how much more teaching I'm actually going to do either. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about making the work. I, I, it's not my age or anything. It's just I want to make work. <laughs> All right, guys, let's see. Uh, let's do this. Um, let me go over here and pull this up real quick. Um, David, you have... Uh, well, you guys, you guys can go to bromoil.com. I was going to pull up his little thing, but bromoil.com has got his email address. It's mm -hmm. got his brushes on there. Um, like I said, I got a, I got a set of uh, those. That set, I can't wait to use it. Um, mm -hmm. And 
the uh, uh, more examples of his work. We didn't even really look at, uh, at, at all of it by any stretch of the imagination. Read his statement and look at all that stuff. Yeah, there's a lot I more. Think, go ahead. There's a lot more that I haven't put on the web too. Uh, I, I bet. Yeah. I'd rather do ink cups and be in front of the computer. So I, that, yeah. that's there you go. That's me too. That's where I'm getting to. So yeah. And just one other thing in closing about the brushes. Please. Brush, brushes shed hair. And you've got to put up with that. And I use a kneaded eraser to pick them up. And if they're tiny little hairs, I use a spotting brush after the print is dry. And I take the print down to a board, a piece of plywood, but I've got archival tissue under it. So the acid doesn't migrate or the resins doesn't migrate to the print. And just touching that little tiny bit of hair will brush it off. Uh, and the other thing too, is I've had one brush come back that was defective and the hair just kept falling out. And um, I find that with a new brush, sometimes I get a lot of hair on it. And what I do is I just watch o walk over to the sink and I just uh, run water over the matrix and the cold water uh, or under temperature under swelling. So it's got to be 72 or less, of course. And then that would just wash the hair off. But I pick them off as I go. And it's frustrating. And the older the brush, the better it is. And each brush has its own character and sure. personality. And, and, and tell us how you clean the brush. What kind of product do you use to clean the brush with? Well, I I used to use carbon tetrafluoride, and then they banned it. Uh, I don't know why, but I guess it's because it'll kill you. Um, I use trichlorethylene if you can get it. And I've been using trichlorethylene since 1970, well, whenever they banned carbon tet. And yeah, Trevor yeah. Jones in England, when I was living there uh, with him, he'd clean his brushes in the dark room with carbon tetrachloride and be smoking at the same time. <laughs> now it was used in fire extinguishers, so it wouldn't explode. But it just drove me crazy to watch him do that. But I use uh, trichlorethylene, and it's the best stuff to use, and I'm very careful with it. I do it outside, whether it's 40 below or 20 below, or it's in the summertime. And I've also listed uh, people want the information on brush cleaner. I can send them an attachment. And there's also uh, green cleaners now, and they're pretty oh. darn effective. I would not use soap and water to clean my Fitch hair brushes. Uh, I use hog hair. I will after a while, after seven to ten ink cups, I'll use, uh, I'll clean them with uh, trichlorethylene. And uh, then I would, um, uh, after they're dry, then I would wash them with my glycerin soap. Let them dry and then put the cones on them. We call them the cone of silence. So um, that's it. And that I think that's from film uh, eight by ten. But anyway, and it was yeah, great. great. Yeah. I wish there was more questions instead of me talking. But. No, no, that's good. I mean, I think I think you've introduced a lot of um, um, cro uh, uh, elements of a process that people weren't really familiar with. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people are familiar with the standard albumin and salt and, but the pigment prints, you know, carbon would be an exception. Most know about carbon, but the pigment prints, these other ones are, are pretty obscure. Um, I, brome oil isn't obscure, but it's just not, it's not out there in the forefront, I guess, because you start with the silver gelatin print. See, in the West Floating world, we're working from all raw materials. So yeah. when we talk about, you know, products and availability of papers and this and that, we're pretty much, and you know this, I'm preaching to the choir, but we're pretty much, we try to self-sustain. We try to look at areas where we can get products constantly without being uh, too adversely affected by the, the, by the um, regulations or costs or whatever it might be. Right. And years ago, um, years ago, when I went to galleries, they didn't know what Bromwell was. So I said, no, we're not interested in seeing your work because they didn't know what it was. They didn't want to embarrass themselves. And that wasn't, that was the norm. It wasn't the exception. And I'm talking about museums also. Yeah. There was right. very, Such very a short memory we have as a, as a people that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. We got another question. Steve asked one here. Okay. Would David mind comparing his method of inking with that of Mortensen or de Monchi? Uh, basically the same. Uh, you have to do the same thing, your walkabouts. And remember, the paper that Mortensen and Damache were using was different than today. It was softer. And when I first started doing Rome, while I was inking up on just about any paper at all, uh, the old papers, not the modern ones like 
Dassonville and Defender, which became DuPont and mm-hmm. um, India Tone, Sycora was the first paper I ever printed on. And they would all make beautiful chrome oils. So the paper was much easier to ink up. And in 1946, Stieglitz complained about the quality of photographic paper. He said it was shit. That's what he said. <laughs> and I have some personal notes about that from uh, a fellow that knew him and uh, he's passed away. But he said they were terrible papers in 1946. And I'm like, oh my God, they are so good. So <laughs> photographers are always complaining. You know, yeah. they're always complaining. Pardon my uh, English, but. Uh, it, it, it's I'm, never it's never pilot error. It's always that. Yeah. It's everything else other than this, right? Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's what we do. That's how we roll. Yeah, and I also played around. I also played around with Fresson uh, prints years ago and made a couple, um, and I got all that information from Paul L. Anderson. So uh, I've got thousands of pages of personal notes from some of the old photographers. Sounds Paul like L. you should be writing a book, David. No, I haven't got time. I got to ink you up. You got to ink up. <laughs> anyway, this I don't know if anybody I've met personally there, but it was great to share some information. And well, David, we, we, thanks. Yeah, we thank you for coming on. You're always you. welcome back on here to share whatever. Yeah. People, I know people start digging into these processes and looking at them. And I think one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, number one, just your vast experience. That that alone justifies everything. And number two, you're, you're like I said earlier, you're sticking with and, and have been true and preoccupied and, and absorbed into these processes for so many decades, I think it's just a, pr- a premier prime example for people to see that there still are people in the world that do actually get really good at something and that are yeah. really o- preoccupied and love and have a passion for something. So yeah. passion alone gets you way down the road in my book. So we greatly appreciate you. And everybody yeah. is talking about, thank you for coming in, David. and. And, and I'll just reiterate all that. I will send you a link to this show if you ever want to share it or whatever yeah. you want to do. And, and I'd love to have you back on after, you know, yeah. six months, eight months, a year, whatever you want. And just do a yeah. little follow up and say, hey, we're just, we just come in and chat. That's all we do, really. Sometimes we show some technical and all that, but we just come yeah. in and chat mostly. Um, I'll do it. Yeah, um, I totally agree. Look at, look at some of these comments. In, that's that's how I feel too, Steve. I, I I too, I truly, uh, and there's in, Will out of, out of PA. Yeah. In closing, let me say this. Every time I go into the dark room from when I was 12 or whatever age it was, it was like magic watching a piece of paper with nothing on it all of a sudden appear. And let me say one other thing. A piece of photographic paper costs, let's say, 30 cents. All right. 30 cents, that's the value of the paper. You put an image on that, and that paper increases in value, perhaps. But it depends on the image and the impact it has, and then the artist. So if you have an image made by Stieglitz or Steichen or Man Ray, I don't care who it is, Martinson, all right, or Karsh, that image is 30 cents, or the paper's 30 cents but it sells for $2,500. So there you are. My partner found a original platinum print of Tina Madotti back in 1970 something. And tell us who Tina Madotti is real quick for the audience. Yeah. Anyway, it was uh, a, a platinum print. It was covered in dust at a thieves market in Oaxaca, Mexico. The kid came up to him and says, I have a famous photographer picture here. And Al couldn't see it at all. So he just brushed it. And it said Weston. And the kid wanted $35. He got it for $25. Okay, his friend was a famous Mexican photographer that was with him at the time. All right. In 1990-something, Al sold that print for $175,000 to a fellow in Texas. Yeah. He paid $25. Interpretation, that paper, that platinum print only cost, what did that paper cost? Ten cents? Five cents? Get the interpretation. It's all interpretation. That's all it is. If you can put interpretation on a piece of paper, then you're successful. You're, you're speaking my language, brother. Thank you so One much for coming in. Yeah. What's that? Anytime. I say someday I'm going to make a great image. 
<laughs> I still haven't taken it. I'm working on it, but I haven't been successful yet. So I think we all are, David. I think that's the mm -hmm. idea that keeps us going and our, our projects and our ambitions alive. And I know, yeah. I know just coming on, I know you've inspired some people. You've got some people to think, and we just appreciate your time. And like I said, you're welcome to come back anytime. Thank you so much. And yep. uh, we'll, we'll close it out there. Everybody says thanks, and we'll see you you're next welcome. time. Go to bromoil.com. Get some brushes. Get his book. Learn about brome oil. It's it's a wonderful process. You you can use wet collodion with it. You can do all of that stuff with it. So try it. See what you think. I'm not Let's, paying him any money either. What's that? <laughs> like I said, I'm not paying you any money for promoting me. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, this show is drama free, yeah. money free. <laughs> And open to anyone that wants to come in and share whatever. We don't. We we don't try to. We don't try to get in that. We we need a place that we can just come and share and not have commerce is a part of our world. It has to be right. I mean, that's yeah. we live in this world, so we have to do that. But we can come in and just talk about prints and crafts and and and, and what we like to do and why we like to do it. So yeah, let me know. When you thank want you me back. so much. Yeah, let me know when you want me back, and I'll. I'll have some photographs and we can go over the photographs of beautiful, I've got maybe four or 500 vintage prints from the old masters. We would but love that. David. I'll, I'll get in touch with you. Okay. Take care now. God bless you all. Thank you, David. You have a great day. You too. Bye. See you guys next week. We're going to have another guest. Um, and you'll love it. Believe me, you're going to love this one as well too. We got another guest coming next week that will blow your mind. I just did a tech check with him yesterday. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you so much for joining me and David. David's a great guy. I appreciate him coming on. And we'll see you next week, ladies and gentlemen. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe and stay happy. We'll see you next Saturday. Bye-bye.